Um, but welcome. Thank you all for joining us for, I suppose this is our second um, October evening program. Um, before we, before I hand things over to Rick, um, I just, I wanted to thank, take, take a moment to thank our nature program series sponsors. Um, and that is Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment for their support of our programming. Um, I also wanted to put in a plug for some of our upcoming programs. Um, and one, this Sunday, we have a field program that is associated with tonight's program. Um, so if anyone's up for taking a jaunt Sunday morning at the Rockwell Sanctuary with uh, with Rick looking for and identifying mushrooms. We do have a few spots um, still available for that 9 to 10.30 a.m. spot I, uh, session. I know that the 10, that the uh, 11 to 20 session is currently full, um, but we do still have a handful of spots for that, that morning session. And you can um, you can call Tin Mountain at 447-6991 if that's something that you are interested in. Um, also, if you like, uh, you know, if you've been joining our programs and you've been enjoying them or if you've just found them, um, you know, we encourage you to support Tin Mountain. The best way to do that is by becoming a member um, and you can do that right on our website on um, under the tab support us um, or you can you know simply if you're you know if you like what you see tonight and would like to help us continue funding these programs um, you can also you know donate five or ten dollars um, again under that support us link um, there is a, a tab specifically for um, you know nature program series so supporting our programs um, in addition to the um, the mushroom walk that Rick is leading on Sunday. Uh, next week, we're very excited. Um, Tin Mountain Energy Team is um, hosting a two-part program on emergency preparedness, focusing on backup power. And so that is um, on uh, Thursday, October 15th and Thursday, October 22nd. The first one is sort the first session is more of an introduction and overview of things you need to consider, um, really sort of understanding what you need to know about the systems in place in your home before you make these decisions. And then the program on the 22nd, we have a handful of, um, you know, experts coming in to, you know, really what we'll, we'll be doing is comparing generators versus battery backup and the whole host of, you know, everything from power walls down to, you know, something that can, can you know, charge your cell phone. Um, so really running the gamut there. But a nice thing to think about before we head into the, uh, you know, head into the hard, you know, head into the winter and storm season. Uh, but I am going to go ahead and, um, should actually make sure. Uh, hand things over to Rick Vanderpool, who uh, one of our favorite presenters, and um, I guess now it's been almost a year uh, that he has also been our interim research director. So Tin Mountain slowly, <laughs> slowly pulling him in more. And I'm being sucked in. <laughs> yes, but I will. Um, I have just if you, I just enabled it, so you should be able. To okay. share. Um, if you have not done a Tin Mountain program, a uh, virtual program with us before, two things to um, keep in mind. I think everyone was sort of muted by default when you were, uh, when you entered. If you have a question, um, the two ways, you know, the two best ways to go about that are there's a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And you can type it right into that box where we see Ed has welcomed us and okay, there we go. And Rick has sent me a message. Uh, <laughs> so so yeah. we uh, so you can type your questions directly into there. And if it is an immediate clarifying one, uh, we can jump in and stop Rick. Otherwise, I'll read through those. Um, 
at the end or at the end of the program, um, you know, you can unmute yourself and, you know, and ask Rick a question directly. Um, and that's my big spiel. And I'll go ahead, yes, now and, and hand things over to All Rick. All right. Well, great, Nora. Thanks and welcome, everybody. Um, it's nice to see some uh, names on some blank screens and those that are on video, you know, the brave ones in the group. Um, thank you for sharing your, your image. I'm, of course, a, a former professor and I'm uh, still getting used to the online world of presentation, but it does save on gas. So I guess there's an educational outtake that's uh, not a bad one in terms of conservation. Uh, but this program is being brought to you uh, uh, online in anticipation, as Nora said, for an actual offline, in-person walk that we will do at Tin Mountain this Sunday, two sessions, as you may have seen advertised, some of you perhaps are gonna attend. Uh, one at nine and one at uh, 10, uh, 11 o'clock. And they run about an hour and a half and we will be physically distanced and I will have a mask on, uh, except uh, for those times when we're far and apart and distant and walking through the woods on our own collecting mushrooms. Um, so then it's, it's your call whether or not that is something that you need to do or feel com more comfortable doing uh, I've been in groups uh, outside now with uh, some people with masks, some without, uh, but that's, that's your, your call in this, at this stage of the game. I think we're fortunate to live in New Hampshire, many of us, or at least be here now, and, uh, and knock on wood that the, the uh, numbers will still be at a dull roar in terms of COVID-19. All right, so let's get to the the program, which is about fungi, it's a very closely allied sort of group of organisms to viruses. Uh, and there is some interplay. We'll talk about uh, antivirals in this uh, talk. I will uh, start, however, with some basic de definitions about mushrooms and fungi. And then we'll roll into what I consider uh, one of the more common reasons why people are interested in mushrooms, and that is uh, their edibility uh, or potentially their toxicity in, in reverse. Um, and of course, those are, go hand in hand. Some mushrooms uh, which are toxic are also medicinal. So we'll talk about medicinal mushrooms as well and we'll run through, run through the hour. I'm going to now share my screen with um, my PowerPoint presentation. And we'll get this booted up. All right, so if I could, for those of you with video, have a thumbs up that you're seeing the PowerPoint. Great, thanks Mackenzie. Um, I entitled this one, How to Safely Eat or Use Mushrooms. And again, that's something that uh, seems to be one of the most common reasons why people come to walks and talks on mushrooms. But keep in mind that uh, there are, of course, many other ways to appreciate the kingdom of fungi or fifth kingdom which I have been doing, by the way, for about 40 years now. Uh, I do have a graduate degree in mycology from San Francisco State. Um, I started a mushroom club down in the Keene area uh, in 1982, believe it or not. Uh, and then subsequently upon moving to Sandwich here 20 years ago, uh, we started the Sandwich Area Mushroom Club. And it's a pretty informal club that basically is a collection of emails that people every so often check to see what, what's the latest news in the mushroom world that I send out sort of as a blog post every so often. I also, um, after our walks and talks um, in the field, I usually put together a species list and I send those species lists out as well for the participants. So that's something that you know, you, you're welcome to join if you so choose and we can talk more about that uh, this Sunday during the walk. All right, so, um, Let's start right ahead um, in terms of eating mushrooms uh, to eat or be eaten as it were. And you may wonder, yes, there are many fungi that decompose organic tissue. So ultimately, unless you're being cremated, this, this too shall pass in the, in the kingdom of the decomposers. So the question, is it edible? Well, it's sort of like kissing a frog 
or maybe even drinking a good beer, that's in quotes, air quotes, that's a Bud Light. Yeah, right. And you have to do more than just sort of, you know, pray for positive results. You really have to know what you're doing. And that is especially true with mushrooms. Um, I teach a lot of classes with families and young kids that are closer to the ground, let's say, have a, sometimes a propensity of putting things in their mouth. So it's very useful, of course, whether it's your kids or grandkids, to uh, know what they're doing in terms of putting stuff in their mouth. Uh, uh, but if you can see my cursor here, of course, many children have this type of reaction to seeing mushrooms. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's sort of a biological uh, genetic predisposition to running and screaming away from mushrooms as demonstrated by chim chimpanzees during various trials with eating mushrooms versus bananas. Um, but nonetheless, we have this uh, love-hate relationship and it's been going on for as long as we've been around as a species. So what is a mushroom? Well, first of all, um, yeah, there comes in many shapes, sizes, and forms. You can see three different uh, types of species. These are actually all higher fungi, so-called. That is to say, they're part of the group of mushrooms that <clears throat> represent larger species that are visible to the naked eye and are, by definition, not molds or mildews, which are more of the sort of microfungi, the so-called lower fungi. Um, and uh, so that's, that's important to make that initial distinction. Uh, but the fruit and body, uh, 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 the mushroom is a fruiting body, and, that's, and that mushroom fruiting body can occur in a variety of different locales. It grows in a bunch of different substrates. Um, most grow on the ground, but certainly there are uh, several hundred thousand species that grow on wood. And again, a lot of their role in nature is to decompose that wood, break it down, recycle the nutrients, and make those nutrients available for other forms of life. The mushroom itself, as you see depicted here in this picture, um, is really uh, for reproduction purposes only. That's really primarily what it is. Um, there are some fungi that have been theorized to have other sort of purposes, but especially those that don't produce spores, but um, um, for the most part, that's what they're doing. It's like an apple on a tree. And consequently, it won't hurt to pick the organism as you're leaving most of it in the ground or in the substrate in which it's growing. Just for you uh, bio buffs, if it's been a while since uh, Biology 101, um, Kingdom of Fungi, our fifth kingdom, uh, have common traits. Uh, they don't move on their own uh, since they're non-modal. They rely on other food sources. Uh, hence, they're heterotrophic versus plants, which are autotrophic and produce their own food. They, like us, have defined nuclei in cell membranes, so they're eukaryotic. And like us, they have many cells to their uh, organism, mostly the mycelium or that part which is growing in the ground, but certainly many cells in the above ground fruiting bodies we call fungi, or uh, mushrooms rather. They're cryptogamic in the way that you can't see the spores, which are the little reproductive packets. Uh, and like us, they're case selected in the sense that they have um, uh, some very highly organized reproductive structures um, whose purpose, of course, is to further the species. Um, and in so doing, they produce millions, if not billions of spores, and only one or a few of them uh, end up being uh, another parent uh, to more spores. Um, they come in many sizes, shapes, and forms, a heterothallic, and they're mostly comprised of chitin and glucan. They're a bunch of different protonated uh, polysaccharides. Chitin, glucan um, are two of the more common ones, but there, there are a number of them uh, that have a slightly different molecular structure than what you find, say, in the lignin or cellulose of plants. And then finally, they have both sexual states, teleomorphic states, and asexual states, our higher fungi, so-called, uh, generally have um, teleomorphic states as their primary means of reproduction. This life cycle diagram shows you our two largest groups. It's sort of a good way to start breaking down the sort of systematics of mushrooms by looking at the cup fungi, which is illustrated here as a cup 
on your left, and then the club fungi, which is illustrated by a gilled mushroom on your right. Both of them have their own sort of life cycle. Whoops, let me go back. Um, and that life cycle is, um, has a bunch of different cell division uh, types of cycles. Um, but ultimately, at some point, for those that are, again, in the sort of higher fungi group, they do have this meiosis mitosis exchange of mitochondrial material or chromosomal material. And that is what allows these fungi to uh, mutate and diversify across all the landscapes on the planet. In the cup fungi, that happens in, in what is called an ascus or sac cell. Uh, and so they're very commonly called the sac fungi. And in the club fungi, they're very, the reproductive um, sort of exchange of genetic material occurs in what is called a basidium. Yeah, which is also shaped like a club, hence uh, another reason to call this the club uh, fungi group. So um, how do you decide whether or not to eat a mushroom? Again, getting back to that sort of common purpose of people looking to, um, well, different tastes, different textures, perhaps like me, you uh, have an affinity for collecting your own food in the wild. Uh, maybe you're a hunter, maybe you're a fisherman, and you know that mushroom sauces make a great dressing. Whatever the reason is, there are certain steps that I highly recommend that you go through in order to make that decision and, and actually effectuate uh, something that, well, to put it simply, could possibly kill you. Um, do you know what it is? That's the first question. And if you don't, then the when in doubt, throw it out rule is really important to keep in mind. Um, you know, why risk it if you don't know what it is? And if you don't, have you looked it up in a reliable field guide or consulted, preferably consulted somebody who knows a lot more than you do, an expert like myself? Um, so there are a lot of people that collect mushrooms. Some of the folks that come on my walks and talks um, have been doing it for a long time. Perhaps their grandparents did it in Russia or Eastern Europe, um, and it's been passed down. And perhaps there's just a few species that uh, you're used to seeing and collecting in the wild. And you wanna venture into perhaps trying a few other ones. There are several hundred really good mushroom species that you can possibly consume in nature. And so, um, yeah, and I, I have my top, top 10 list so-called, and as I'm sure a couple of you have heard me say, um, that top 10 list has at least 50 species in it. So yeah, there are a lot of good mushrooms to eat and they're fruiting right now. Uh, I just picked a great batch of wild oysters uh, day before yesterday, and uh, I'm looking forward to cooking them up for another class I'm teaching on Saturday. So, uh, First thing, do you know what it is? And then do you have any allergies to particular foods? There are a lot of people that have allergies to eating wild mushrooms. And it depends on A, what they have allergies to sort of that they know about. Uh, for example, people who have a slight allergy to avocados or very rich foods um, will typically react with sulfur shell for chicken of the woods mushrooms. Um, people that have allergies to molds and mildews could also have a general allergy to mushrooms, as certain types of mushrooms as well. Um, so that's something you need to keep in mind. And being on the North American Poison Control uh, call list and toxicology committee, I can tell you that um, there's always somebody every year that, that eats a very common wild edible mushroom and gets a, you know, has an allergic reaction to it. It's just a matter of, you know, numbers. And as many of you know, um, allergies are pretty common around fall with the plant world, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen with, um, with fungi as well. Uh, have you written out your will? This is something, of course, you know, that's <laughs> something useful. And uh, yeah, okay. A little brevity. Are there any dead people looking greedily over your shoulder? If not, then you can proceed to the next step. The do's and don'ts. Do cook every wild mushroom thoroughly, okay? You don't want to eat raw mushrooms. Uh, you won't be able to easily digest them. 
and cooking them, of course, renders them more assimilable by your digestive system. Do save a little bit aside that you haven't eaten. For us, poison control volunteers who prefer to see wild mushrooms um, and not uh, a bag full of vomitus show up on our microscope table. Um, so that would be helpful for us who can then help you with um, you know, treating your symptoms uh, after having eaten perhaps a poisonous one. Do not eat more than about an ounce of fresh mushrooms cooked the first time through. That seems to be about the right amount relative to providing enough uh, of the fleshy portion that you know if you have a problem with it, you will. And if you don't have a problem with it, it'll be fine. Don't drink when you first eat wild mushrooms if you haven't. Um, a lot of mushrooms create an ant abuse type reaction. And I'll go into a little bit of that in a minute uh, when you uh, eat them with alcohol. Uh, and do not combine them, please, with other mushrooms. Otherwise, it's a little tough, again, to figure out which one caused the symptoms. Uh, and then last, don't try feeding it to your cat, your dog, or your mother-in-law first. That's just a little tidbit piece of advice. Um, yeah. Pretty, pretty self-evident. Although you may have somebody that, you know, is not in your will and, and or is, I should say, is in your will and uh, you want to, you want to test it out on them. That's fine. Okay. I didn't say that. So here's what you might get out of eating wild mushrooms, something that uh, a lot of people ask me about. What is the nutritional value? Uh, whether you're eating cauliflower or a wine cap or some nice tasty bowl eats. So, um, there's some great, great options out there. Uh, some porcini sliced up in a fry pan. I'm salivating just looking at that. The first thing you realize that mushrooms are generally low in fats, but they're high in linoleic acid. All right, and that's um, an essential fatty acid that we can't produce, our bodies don't produce, and is necessary for a variety of different metabolic functions, including the production of, of various antigens. And so that's a good thing. They're low in carbohydrates, but they're high in fiber. So eating mushrooms is obviously a very good diet food. It helps digest other foods you've eaten, uh, and yet doesn't have that. Um, you know, polyunsaturated fat carbohydrate combo that you get in, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken that's going to be a problem down the road. They're low in vitamin C, but they're very high generally in vitamin B. And that's particularly uh, B6, but also thiamine and riboflavin, uh, B1 and 2. They're fairly high, depends on the mushroom you eat, and not certainly all of our mushrooms have been assayed for their vitamin contents. Uh, and lastly, they're high in minerals, which is a great thing as well. But uh, keep in mind that they do uh, absorb uh, the minerals that are in the immediate environment of where they're growing. So uh, roadside mushrooms, yeah, not probably a great idea if they're on the ground. If they're on a tree, that's different because they're, they're living on the wood in the tree. And that wood doesn't necessarily contain and usually doesn't contain the sort of toxic heavy metals that would otherwise be absorbed uh, on the ground. So minerals. Um, in terms of lipids, like I said, they're generally less than 2% by dry weight uh, uh, of fat. And most of these are linoleic and oleic acids. Uh, they have some protoleic acid as well, a couple of other uh, essential amino acids. Um, and shiitakes are a really good source for those uh, unsaturated fatty acids. Uh, and they have been tested, although um, if you notice in this bowl, those have been sort of smothered in butter. So the fat thing, yeah, maybe doesn't work so much <laughs> if you end up cooking your mushrooms in a lot of butter or oil. Um, carbohydrates, like I said, the polysaccharides that they have um, are largely indigestible. And so cooking them renders them more so. But keep in mind that mannitol, which is one of the polysaccharides in, say, the button mushroom and a couple of others, uh, is fairly indigestible. 
um, for young young bodies. Generally, they say by the time you get to age two, you can eat it without having complete diarrhea. By the time you're six, you're you're probably pretty good. But kids have a little more difficulty uh, digesting uh, those uh, polysaccharides. Um, and then, of course, the protein-rich compounds with the amino acids are rendered more assimilable by by cooking. So keeping that in mind. Um, Six to eight times the amount of vitamin B6 as, is, as you find in spinach. That was one of the conclusions of, of, the, of the assays on the button mushroom. Hence, uh, brain food is, was sort of a, a term used for the button mushroom back in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think there are other mushrooms that perhaps exceed that level of vitamin B6. Um, certainly, it, it appears to be true with um, uh, lion's mane or, or bear's head, uh, coral tooth, all common names for the herisium species. Um, but there are, there are some really good, uh, again, vitamin and mineral bases for eating mushrooms. And uh, the, some of the lawn mushrooms I, I've found have also been tested for vitamin A and they're very high in vitamin A. It's unclear to me how they're necessarily manufacturing that. Uh, perhaps that is in some association with the uh, grasses and herbs that grow in lawns. That's a suspicion because, of course, dandelion is pretty high in vitamin A as well. But uh, nonetheless, that's, uh, these are some of the uh, aspects of eating mushrooms for, for uh, nourishment and nutrition that I think are important to keep in mind. So what else can you do with fungi? Well, um, some people have figured this out. I came across these last year, had never seen them before. Uh, and they dry these shiitakes just like this. They sort of soak them in a brine and they sell them as shiitake mushroom harvest chips. That was pretty kind of pretty neat. And they actually pretty tasty. Uh, <laughs> I can eat a bag full of those, no problem. I, I must say it hasn't hit the you know, the, the stores and the shelves quite as hard as, as Lay's potato chips or sun chips or something like that. But who knows? Maybe the, the market will, will expand. You can run all kinds of experiments with mushrooms. Here we have um, just a sample of mold on some milk products and pretty fascinating to see which mold over time overcomes the other ones and what they do. And they have this sort of little battle going on for the nutritional value of the milk or the lactose. And uh, so that's kind of fun. Uh, you can make spore prints by laying out caps of mushrooms on paper. And in a couple of hours, you'll have these beautiful spore prints of various colors. Um, I have a book of them that I made in graduate school and um, I actually um, I tried spraying on some fixative that didn't work so well. Laminating them is a little bit better, um, you know, to make them more permanent because otherwise these spore powder piles just disappear. And of course, I love to teach mushrooms, especially with kids, um, and they're just so enthusiastic about it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's always fun. And I would note uh, this uh, visage of Tanan cattle from the uh, ancient Aztec uh, civilization in central Mexico. Uh, yeah, mushrooms have been a part of art forms for several thousand years. So that's, it's kind of neat. Uh, and in fact, if you really get into the sort of lore and mythology of mushrooms, you can find this iconic depiction of the tree of life. Um, represented by Amanita muscaria, this, uh, plate was part of the Soma book that Gordon Wasson wrote. Um, and it was uh, an investigation on how humans have integrated sort of mushrooms into their culture for a long period of time. And in some cases, as represented by Adam and Eve here, use them in sort of more spiritual ways. So, and with that, I would sort of end this use of mushrooms uh, tour with a uh, a, a positive word about their medicinal value. Um, we have uh, a couple of good books out there on the medicinal mushrooms. Dennis Benjamin put one out not too long ago that updated uh, Christopher Hobbs's book that's depicted here. 
Uh, so Dennis Benjamin, Christopher Hobbs, Greg Marley over in Maine put a book out, Mushrooms for Health. So there's a couple of them out there that give you some basics in terms of how you can use medicinal mushrooms. And believe it or not, not unlike you know herbs, uh, you know plant materials, uh, there are a whole host of medicinal values for mushrooms. And uh, whether you're you know eating a uh, sulfur shelf, so-called, or some people call it chicken of the woods, um, or a reishi mushroom. This one's uh, similar to Ling Ji or Ling Chi, uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's used uh, in these finger-like forms of this polypore is used medicinally, especially in Asia. Um, they have a whole host of, of different properties. Again, this one, um, this list is, is a fairly short list, but I think significant if you look at things that are antibacterial, we know about that, uh, penicillin, cyclosporin, all those, uh, but anti-tumoral, we have a lot of different polypores, turkey tails and others that are really effective in reducing cancerous tumors in mice in clinical trials. Humans have been using it, it's been tested on human uh, humans occasionally. Uh, the trials are few and far between, but um, you know these are coming more and more online. And of course, the antiviral properties has become even more of, a, of an interest given this year's <laughs> devastating spread of COVID-19. Um, and I can tell you that I normally drink a chaga tea, uh, you know, starting in the fall to sort of ward off flu and the flu and cold season. But I started drinking that uh, uh, in March again, or kept drinking it and hasn't, haven't stopped. <laughs> and who knows, but I'm, I'm going to ramp up my, my odds as it were by drinking a, a well-known antiviral uh, tea, if I can. You've got blood cleansers and uh, hypo and hyperglycemic uh, sugar regulators. Uh, in the mushroom world, you've got some mushrooms that really work well on, on enhancing your cardiovascular system. Uh, I mentioned chaga before, uh, has been shown to um, reduce cholesterol in the bloodstream. Uh, of course, a lot of mushrooms with their fiber and digestive aids, they're ones that protect the liver, is, stimulate uh, the immune response, uh, create uh, T cell antibodies through uh, the translocation of linoleic acids. Um, they stop blood, they're styptics, they're T cell enhancers, as I mentioned. And of course, many of them are good tonic teas is like you find in the plant world. So there's a whole host of medicinal uses out there. And um, I would, I just leave it up to you to do your own research. Uh, don't trust online sources necessarily. There are a lot of claims out there that mushrooms will, you know, solve all your problems. Um, not necessarily so. We're all very different individuals, so keep that in mind. So in terms of conservation, um, I recommend, since these are the mushrooms are fruiting bodies, that you just pick the above ground portion or the portion that's on the tree. Uh, picking clean and fresh parts in the field will make it a little easier when it comes when you come back to the kitchen to prepare them. Uh, only pick what you need unless you find that uh, you have a good uh, sort of recipe for, for preserving mushrooms, which uh, I'll talk more about this weekend. Uh, there's a lot of ways to preserve mushrooms. Uh, I certainly put up uh, you know, dozens and dozens of pounds, usually between 60 and 100 pounds a year, I put up and then uh, my wife and I just pick away at that pile for the rest of the, the winter and, and spring until mushroom season rolls back around in the summer. Um, there are some mushrooms that you um, need to dig for. We do have a couple of truffles in the Northeast, none of which are really very tasty, so it's not a big practice, but certainly out West, uh, truffling is a, is a huge pastime, and, and there's a lot of disturbance to the forest floor when you, when you truffle, since these guys are generally underground and you need rakes. Um, if you have the capacity to know that something's rare, please don't pick it. Uh, the spores that are left on the mushroom are you know, gonna help its own reproduction. Although I will say, because I've had this question asked a lot, um, if you do find a mushroom that's open, like the ones on the tree here, um, that uh, Bev is about to pick these brick caps, uh, at this stage, you know, 80 or 90% of the spores have already been shot off, so it's not, you know, again, you're not going to have a, a big impact on this 
this mushroom by picking the fruit bodies. So it's just a few words about, about conservation. So, uh, you know, in sum, don't forget the edibility rule, but there is no edibility rule. You have to know what the mushroom is. And as I've reminded folks many times, you can always eat a mushroom at least once. So, so a little bit more about how toxic a fungi can be, a fungus can be. And there are several different toxins that we have to address. Um, David Aurora, yeah, this guy has bolita virosis, he called it. And uh, this is what happens when you eat too many bolides out in California, I guess. I don't know. Um, but seriously, we do have some, some significant toxin groups. And I want to review some of those so that you uh, at least are familiar with what you're up against. And then perhaps a few of the sample treatments. So Keep in mind they produce a lot of spores and some people have allergies to spores, particularly puffball spores. So that's, a, that's one of the few sort of, you know, non-consumption types of responses that could be a slightly toxic. Um, we do have a couple of mushrooms uh, that, or fungi I should say, that produce epidermal issues. Uh, the white nose syndrome with bats is a fungus. Um, Pseudogymnoascus destructans actually um, is a contact dermatitis that, that uh, stresses the body in bats, but we have some mushrooms in Southeast Asia in the Pleurotus group that also cause, causes a dermatitis upon contact. That's pretty rare, all right? So most of the time we're dealing with, you know, toxins that enter the body that on, as a result of eating, and that's where you get into this issue with damaging the summer, stomach line, lining, uh, damaging liver or kidney cells, uh, and they can do so uh, with remarkable efficiency. Um, as a result, you're going to have, you know, bodily fluids leaving any orifice that you've got <laughs> practically with some of these. And uh, the more pernicious issue is dealing with what they leave behind in terms of secondary toxins like cyclopeptides or other phagocytic enzymes, things that sort of, you know, cause internal bleeding by destroying your, your cells. Um, and this is not very common, dying from eating wild mushrooms, but it happens every year somewhere in the world. Uh, the U.S. averages between one or two people a year that die from eating poisonous mushrooms. So when you look at their constituents, as we say, carbohydrates and these glycoproteins, uh, they're good reservoirs for some of these toxins. They also have uh, some of the toxins bind with the lipids really well. And upon digestion of those oleic and linoleic acids, those toxin groups can be released into the bloodstream. Um, the more difficult ones that are harder to get out of the toxin, uh, toxic uh, properties are the terpenes, carotenoids, and sterols. They're a little bit more complex, but our body's pretty good at breaking these things down uh, in the stomach. So um, it will release those high amount of vitamins and minerals, but also those toxins as well. So on the good side, we've got beta-lactam antibiotics, the penicillin, as I said, cyphalus cephalosporin, amoxicillin, all the psyllin groups that have shown to have good antibiotic activity, um, most of which are general antibiotics. They're not necessarily specific, uh, but nonetheless play a very useful role in, say, you know, uh, preventing infection in, in wounds, both internally and externally. We have some that have plant growth uh, regulators that really help with the actual production of fruit, for example, the ethylene production in grapefruits and so forth is assisted by mushrooms growing with the roots. Um, and then you've got these indole alkaloid groups, which are, um, let's see, those aren't on this sheet here. Oh, here they are, ergometrine and ergotamine, LSD, you may have heard of, psilocybin. Um, these are all alkaloid groups that uh, become active when you break this nitrogen-hydrogen bond at the end of the indole uh, cycle. And then you've got these uh, cyclic um, uh, oligopeptides, and those are where you get into some real problems because you, you lyse some of these toxins, vomitoxins, xeralanone, and you, you can end up with some real internal problems. 
the, so the toxin groups are summarized here. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, they numbered them. Uh, more commonly now, that you're, if you look at toxin groups uh, that are being uh, trained with doctors, and if you go to a hospital, these it'll be under the classes, the classes of, of toxins. And we'll go through each one of these uh, and show you some common members of the uh, of the mushroom uh, group that that you can get into. Amanita, for example, this destroying angel is probably the most common and one of our most deadly mushrooms in the Northeast. The Gallerina group, which is this little LBM on wood, also have these class A cyclopeptides that will make you sick for a while and you get better, okay? A period of relative calm, but then those cyclopeptides go to work on your liver and they digest those cells and you die of liver failure um, after going through a period of a coma that usually lasts only about 24 to 48 hours. So that's if you're untreated and you eat a mushroom of this size, okay, of this group, and there's several of these. Um, class B is also potentially fatal in terms of having um, some significant um, um, also cyclopeptides, but of a different group that cause uh, uh, kidney failure in this case. Uh, it really affects the kidneys, and this is represented by our most common um, Cortinarius or webcap mushroom, Cortinarius rubellus, as it depicted here. And this one grows in the Northeast. It's not very common. And again, it's not, doesn't look like any kind of edible really. So you'd have to really be taking a risk to eat something like this. But that's one of our other uh, potentially fatal mushrooms. And this is the group they're in. Gyromitra, also potentially fatal. If you were to eat this one raw, you would probably die. It's pretty significant. And it's not just that gyromitrin as a toxin um, causes neurological failure, which basically shuts down your parasympathetic systems and, and you die from your own asphyxiation, uh, but it also um, liberates monomethyl hydrazine, which is otherwise known as rocket fuel, when you boil them. So you can render this edible, which is why some of them, like this guy here, Gyromitra esculenta, which means edible in Latin, um, and I might say it's very tasty, um, you have to make sure you're well ventilated. You know, have your, your, your oven or stove top fan on when you're cooking these things, because um, otherwise you could have a problem with the ingesting or breathing in this MMH. Class D toxins are the ones that are like antabuse. They mimic that in the way that if you drink alcohol with them, they will make you throw up. <laughs> it's very simple. It causes very rapid emesis. And I've had a couple of my students do this in spite of my sound warnings. Do not drink when you're eating shaggy manes, for example. Coprinus comatus, the shaggy mane mushroom, a really delicious one. And I had a class full of 20 students, and all of them ate uh, shaggy mane. And six of them went home and drank beer afterwards, and two of them got sick out of those six. Even though I said alcohol within 24 hours is probably not a good idea with eating any kind of coprinus. Uh, and that's really why it's called coprinin, because that's the toxin name for this group of mushrooms. Uh, class E is our are indole alkaloids. It's similar to ergot, where you've got these the baocystin, psilocin, and psilocybin as your active principles. And th that effect is really a, a neurological one in your brain, and hence it has uh, sort of can produce feelings of levity, disorientation. If you eat a lot of them, you can get hallucinations. And this is, of course, you know, the source of so many of the questions I get. Uh, from especially young adults who are out to look for mushrooms for pretty much only one reason. And uh, yeah, unfortunate because um, they're not really very tasty, I'll put it that way, but they're trying to have some type of drug trip, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, the cultures that use these mushrooms for thousands of years in Mesoamerica did so under sort of strict guidance of shamans or shamanesses, and, and that was very purposeful. It was, it was not a sort of recreational activity, it was to get rid of evil spirits.
But nonetheless, these are listed as controlled substances by the local authorities, so you could get arrested if you pick and eat these things, or at least pick them. Some other people seeking a sort of trip, as it were, use the Alice in Wonderland mushroom, so-called Amanita muscaria, also known as the fly agaric, depicted here with these nice warts on the cap, a ring on the stalk, and a swollen bulb with concentric rings of tissue at the base. And this guy will make you sick for sure. Um, and of course, some people are whatever, they're hardcore. They, they don't mind getting a little sick if they can have some type of uh, trip as it were. But nonetheless, it does produce uh, tremors, dizziness, heart palpitations, uh, sweats, and so forth, and um, can produce hallucinations, which can be very threatening and, and not a pleasant experience after going through the, the necessary several hours of gastric upset. Um, muscomol is one of the properties, but ibotenic acid is really the one that's going to make you sick. That's the, the one that really causes, wreaks havoc in your gastric system. Muscarine is similar in that way, uh, but it's slightly different. I mean, it's similar in the way that you'll have nausea and have upset stomach, but it also uh, brings out intense salivation uh, and, and, and lacrimation. So your fluids from all your orifices will be hard at work if you ate a class G muscarine containing mushroom like this inosibi or this entoloma over here on the right. And so there are some real problems with this. The good news is that for muscarin, atropine is a really quick and effective antidote. And again, most doctors I speak to in emergency rooms know this and have atropine on hand to administer. Um, and I've only had a few cases of, of this that I've dealt with in the Northeast, fortunately, um, mostly with amanitis that contain muscarin. But uh, nonetheless, this is one you want to stay away from. And last but not least, we have all these various unknown toxins that are generally GI irritants. Um, there's a whole host of mushrooms here that uh, are represented, bolites and trichilomas and nolanias and lactarius, puffballs, all of these have potential, will cause gastric upset, uh, even when thoroughly cooked. They have constituents in them that vary by the species and um, most commonly, they can be just treated by, um, you know, activated charcoal and uh, making sure you drink plenty of fluids. So in terms of uh, the deadliest ones, I mentioned this in the uh, trivia contest. Um, and so here's the sort of answer of the six most common deadly mushrooms in the Northeast. I might suggest also point out that the death cap is a pretty recent arrival. Didn't have it in the 70s and 80s. My first death cap uh, was sent to me as a picture. Here's an image of that death cap mushroom from a uh, veterinary hospital in Massachusetts where it does occur uh, on the coastal plain on occasion. Uh, I have yet to see this mushroom in New Hampshire, but it's occurred also in Maine and of course in Connecticut and Rhode Island. So it is coming. And then we have other ones like this Lepiota in this pinkish chestnut Lepiota group, which is super rare in terms of people consuming them because they're much more common out west. Uh, but this is a deadly mushroom. Uh, I don't know anybody who's eaten this. Um, I, I have a hard enough time finding them in the East, to be honest with you. But out West, there are, have been so, several poisonings eating various lepios because they look pretty tasty. And they actually look very similar, some of them, to a very edible lepiota, uh, macro lepiota, uh, which grows in open fields. So, you know, that's where a lot of people have gotten into trouble is eating these mushrooms that look like uh, other very edible mushrooms. So in terms of treatments, um, emesis and lavage, fluids and antibiotics, and uh, psilbin um, is really, which is an extract of um, a thistle. Um, this is something that Europe, Europe has authorized, and we have now through this company, Legalon, an antibiotic that can be administered for these fatally toxic mushrooms. And so it's, it's now pretty rare that anybody dies from these things because they usually get one or more of these substances injected 
and they have some uh, ACTH stimulation, uh, usually through direct injection into the liver, and that produces antigens that will then um, destroy or at least decompose most of the cyclopeptides that get administered through the amatoxin group. Um, when you deal with orolanins and coprinins, activated charcoal, which you'll see represented as a good general approach for anything that uh, causes irritating irritation to the gastrointestinal, um, that's pretty common. Uh, and then uh, same goes with muscimol ibutenic acid. Um, physostigmine is administered, especially if it's a muscimol uh, poisoning and atropine uh, can help with uh, ipotenic acid, although it's much better with muscarin, right, as I mentioned. So, can we use these two toxic mushrooms to our advantage? Well, certainly with penicillin, absolutely. Um, we do have some anti-blood clotting agents that, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember what um, some of my elders were using that, um, um, and I'm sure some of you probably are more familiar with this than I, but there are ways to sort of um, administer, use mushrooms for that purpose in terms of improving your circulatory and bloodstream uh, system without um, getting into uh, anti-blood clotting agents. There are also several mushrooms that are useful in recycling. Uh, our turkey tails are not only medicinal, they do a great job in breaking down paper waste and are being used by a large number of the timber industries, or, or I should say paper manufacturing, timber-based industries. Um, yeah, there's always some hallucinogens. Um, and don't forget that um, the yeast that we have in wine and beer, um, those are part of the fungi kingdom. Yeast are simple forms of one of the groups, one of the divisions of fungi. And uh, yeah, so they have been with us for many, many thousands of years and provided hopefully just the right amount of inebriation. But if not, and you have sort of gone too far, then at least keep in mind mushrooms will have recycling value. Okay. I'm going to stop it there, and I've been going at it pretty hard for about 50 minutes, and I'll be happy to, um, I'm going to check your chat questions. Porcini here, yes. There are many different um, types of Boletus edulis group mushrooms in our area. Uh, the most common that we find is what I find anyway is Boletus chippewaensis, and that's a delicious uh, porcini type mushroom. But we do have the true Boletus edulis, variety edulis, on occasion here in New Hampshire. Um, <laughs> is your will made? <laughs> and of course, yes, the old phrase they're old mushroom eaters and they're bold mushroom eaters, but they're no old bold mushroom eaters indeed thank you alex smith at least he as far as i know is attributed to stating that um, and so let's see i found the anabuse type reactions and have with coprinus comatus uh, indeed but yes with atramentarius and micaceous so and that's a good point i mean micaceous is well known atramentarius they call the alcohol inky but that's one reason why i advised against it and if you read uh, David Aurora's um, Mushrooms Demystified, you will see under Caprinus comatus that on rare occasions, people have the same antabuse reaction uh, with drinking alcohol and shaggy manes. It's rare, but it does happen. And again, my, my two students who ate comatus and had beers after prove that point, that it's uncommon, but it does happen. Um, yeah, so those are great questions. And uh, Nora, I'm open to. Uh, Opening up for others, if people have them, you want to unmute yourself and fire away. Yeah, so if any, thank you, um, Rick. Uh, if any folks have questions they want to ask, um, you know, Rick directly, just go ahead and, um, and unmute yourself. Um, I had one question, I, and I am, I will say, I am not a mushroom. <laughs> I'm a mushroom 
Um, but in pulling together the trivia questions, and, and I know, you know, you saying a lot of the, you know, poisonings um, happen when people eat a lookalike. Um, with destroying angel, is there an, a common edible mushroom that it gets confused for? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it depends on your discrimination skills, right? Um, like, you know, I've heard it said that, you know, all of us white folks look alike. Um, <laughs> you have pink spored mushrooms that are white and tall in the agaric group that are edible. And you've got um, this nice Lepiota parasol mushroom that can be kind of whitish on the cat that grows in fields, I was mentioning, Macrolepiota, that they could be confused. And if you pick the destroying angel without the bulb at the base, then you don't have that feature. So the biggest concern is, and, and this is something that I'm, I'm glad to say we don't have here, but in Southeast Asia, there's this absolutely stunning edible Amanita that is almost pure white. And so initially, so many of our poisonings out West with Amanita out there, Ocreata, which is another destroying angel type, was by virtue of these, what we used to refer to as the boat people, the Indonesians, or the Indonesians, Southeast Asians that would come to the West Coast to get out of the Vietnam War or avoid being, you know, they, their homes were destroyed or whatever. And they came and tried to fend for themselves by eating the mushrooms that looked like what they had at home. And that's where we ended up getting a lot of different deaths. Koreans, Japanese, I mean, all Asia, East Asians, because that's where this mushroom grows. So there is in East Asia a look like here, not so much so. But we do have others that, that could be a problem. Great question. Um, and I have, I have one more. Um, sure. for you. And that is, and I suppose, I guess this would have to be by volume or weight, but what, um, what is the most commonly foraged mushroom in New Hampshire? Ah, that's a good question. So I would have to say oyster. That would be probably right up there. Um, chanterelles are highly sought after, but and so it's maybe a toss up. But in in general, if you think about chanterelles having maybe two this year, only one flush. That was we had a little brief July period with chanterelles. Where oysters, you can have oysters starting in June and going all the way through November. I like I said, I just picked up great oysters off of a sugar maple the other day. Um, I'd say by volume, probably oyster mushroom. And keep in mind, New Hampshire Mushroom Company, which is just down the street here in Tamworth, uh, sells oyster mushrooms that are cultivated. And in fact, they have three or four different types of cultivated oysters, the blue oyster, the king oyster, the pink oyster, and so forth. And they're just, you know, they're great. They taste just as good as they do uh, if you pick wild ones. Um, I do see a, a, a question. What's on the backdrop? I was going to ask you guys that if anybody could identify what's in my backdrop. <laughs> uh, I know, right? No. Yeah. Notice is on you. Well, I, t I don't know whether to entice you to, I'll give you the answer on Sunday, but I'll give you a hint. It's a polypore mm. and it's on a big old beach tree. And it, this was the first time I saw this one in the East and it had a brief period, about three years where it was, pretty much everywhere and I had never seen it for like 30 years. So you have these mushrooms that come up for a bunch of years and then they almost disappear. So that was one of this, this polypore, Fomatopsis. I'll give you the genus name. All right, and then the question followed, uh, did I study with Dennis Desjardins? Yeah, I was in graduate school with him. Uh, he got his master's thesis um, at the end of my first year. And uh, I know Dennis pretty well. I, I haven't seen him for, for a little while, but we're in, you know, occasional contact. So that's kind of neat. This person said that they used to live, uh, live out there and retired to North Conway. So, well, congratulations. And if you do know Dennis, say hi to him for me. I don't see him enough. He's a great guy. Not one yellow or black chanterelle have I found this season. 
my heart bleeds for you because I haven't either. <laughs> well, that's not true. I haven't found any black chanterelles or trumpets, but I have found some yellows. And most of those have been the smooth uh, one called uh, Craterellus lutescens. They grow along stream sides. And um, Nora knows which stream sides that I've been working on a lot. Hint, <laughs> hint, hint. And there were lots of those smooth chanterelles out there. That was probably my best summer crop mushroom because it was so dry. You had to be pretty much in water to find mushrooms this summer. It's just a bizarre and terrible year. You know, and I hear a lot of people complaining about the rain when it comes. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the answer to our success in the mushroom world. So bring it on. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll find some stuff. Uh, you know, things are popping out. We will find some stuff on Sunday. Um, I've, you know, just by my casual walking around the woods, I'll be out in the woods tomorrow. And if I find some things there, I'll, I'll bring them with on Sunday. I have some show and tell, but we will find some stuff, even if we have to go right down into the pond or the stream to find it. Uh, there will be some things out. So okay. any other questions? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. I've noticed sometimes in the yard or on the terrace, they're very tiny little button looking ones and they're kind of in a cluster. There are mm -hmm. several of them. Are those not edible? Uh, well, I need to know what they are. And you, you've just described about 10 <laughs> different types that like to grow in lawns. There, there's some out right now in the uh, sandwich fairgrounds that are little button mushrooms, uh, but there are several that would fit that description. So I encourage, if you do want to know something as a follow-up, I offer this to folks, um, send, take a picture with your phone or whatever and send mm -hmm. that along. I'm happy to help out, particularly if you want to eat something. I, yeah, I just sure. assume you not go ahead and eat things that you don't know what they are. So I'm happy to answer some questions and um, um, again, I can be contacted through Tin Mountain, uh, or you can just, if you see my name there, I have a website, and on the website, there's an email link on the website, mm -hmm. and it's rickvanderpaul.com. So all you have to do is know how to spell Rick Vanderpaul, and you're good. Mm -hmm. You get there. <laughs> all right, Sandy, great. Others? All right, well, thank you so much yeah, Mackenzie Nelson and everybody else great great <laughs> participation great questions and I hope I see a bunch of you on Sunday yes yeah, so I would I would remind folks because if you see it on our website um, there it right now the 11 o'clock session is full but we do have a handful of spots um, left in the 9 a.m. session on Sunday but we do ask that you reserve those spots so that we're able to keep um, you know, keep people safe and, and keep our numbers down. And you can do that just by, um, by calling Tin Mountain or, um, you know, or emailing info at tinmountain.org. Um, but Rick, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. You're welcome. Said, it will be, um, it's, we should by next week be up on the website um, for anyone who needs to go back and brush up uh, or double check anything that, that Rick said. Yeah, absolutely. And it is Fomatopsis spragii. <laughs>